So I watched, I don't watch a lot of Christian movies, uh, and I, I know some of you love Christian movies, but I, I don't, um, I wrestle with them. Uh, I like good act, acting, and there's, uh, <laughs> sometimes it's tough, just admit it, it's tough. Uh, but I had knee surgery back in the winter of '09. I'd blown on my knee playing basketball, and, uh, I'd, and so I had knee surgery, and it finally just gotten real bad, and I needed to replace it, or replace it, just repair it. And I was at my in-law's house, and they had found a movie that they wanted us to watch. It was about making your marriage uh, better, which we, it's like someone getting you soap for Christmas, you know, like hey, we want to show you this movie that's going to make you taller or whatever. It's just make you better as a c couple. Rachel and I had been married at that time for five years, and we felt like we were doing great. And there was a, uh, but they made us watch this movie. And it was about this guy who was awful. He was an awful guy and an awful husband. And his wife wanted him to be a better husband. I'm oversimplifying, and I promise. And uh, she, then, then this older guy comes in and says to this younger guy, hey, I can help you out. All you have to do is do, follow this book. And they read a book, it's called, uh, it's a dare of some sort, and about love, and then they, you read it, and then it's, your marriage will get better. All you got to do is that. Well, he, he does it, and it doesn't work. And then he finally sells his fishing boat, which he loves, to buy his wife's uh, parents some hospital equipment for their house. Now, usually I'm pretty good at keeping my thoughts to myself. But I'm on Percocet at the time, which is a drug. And so the movie ends, and I said, but what if I don't have a boat? How's my marriage going to survive my lack of a boat? Which was not okay to say out loud. I'm acknowledging. It's still funny. But the, it, didn't, it struck me that, that the book didn't work. He had to sell his boat. Or there's other movies where it's just, there's, we got to pray real hard and then our football team wins. That's happened. That's a movie. Does that work? Is that what you said? <laughs> several, several, there's several movies about that. But then I saw one recently. It's a trailer for one. We're all going to go see it together. It's about a group of, in this world, the Bible is illegal to have and we're smuggling Bibles through the the backwoods of the US um, one I thought it was already done well by Eastern European missions they did that actually in, in over in uh, Eastern Europe but the opening of this trailer says, and I know this is grammatically incorrect, but this is how they said it, and I'm saying it like they said it. What if the Bible was illegal? What if? We'd have to collect them and smuggle them to people. Maybe. But the whole premise is these, pe these people are sprinting through the woods trying not to get arrested for having a Bible and standing up for the word of God. Same thing happens whenever we decide that we want to pray on a football field. We say, oh, what? they're persecuting us, and it's not, we're not allowed to be Christian in schools. Which is insane, because I believe you can still pray wherever you want to. And I believe you can love your neighbor wherever you please. I don't know why Christians are dying to be persecuted. 
the slightest little thing. We don't say, you didn't say Merry Christmas at J.C. Penney, and all of a sudden, J.C. Penney hates me. The slightest little thing, and we want to be persecuted. We're creating full movies about, about how, oh, maybe someday we're going to be persecuted. It's like we're just we're anxious for it. Christianity one day will be difficult on us. Well, there's the problem. If you haven't tried loving your neighbor like they're an actual human being, then you don't know how difficult Christianity can be. The thing, the simple things to understand that Jesus calls us to are difficult to do. Have you ever had to forgive someone? Like actually do it. Not just say it and or, or just, I'm good at forgetting, actually. I'm pretty good at forgetting. But then it'll just boil underneath for a long time. Letting people go. Not summing up people by their worst mistakes. Have you tried that? It's tough. Have you, have you loved your neighbor? Notice I'm not saying have you loved everybody. Because loving everybody is easy. Everybody isn't your neighbor. Everyone is this big, this uh, expansive idea about, they're, it's, they're out there. Oh, I love them. They're fine until they cut me off in traffic. I was walking out of Academy Sports this week, and someone was walking like this. This is how they were walking. Out that door. That's not even walking. That's just standing on one foot and then standing on the other one. It wasn't I, just... That's my neighbor. To have patience and love for everyone I come in contact with is difficult. It's more difficult to live the Christian life now unoppressed than it would be if we were just trying to get Bibles to North Carolina. It is difficult to live the Christian life. And I don't mean that as in, well, you got to quit sinning. No, how you value humans matters to Jesus. How you value the people around you, how you interact with the world around you, it matters to Jesus. And so when Jesus comes to teach the world and he says, do not, you've heard it said, do not commit murder. But I tell you, the way you handle people when you're angry matters. He's not dismissing an old commandment. He's expounding on a new one. And this is actually the way the rabbis did it. If there, were, if there was a good rabbi, a, a, a good rabbi who was, everyone were coming, he had a new teaching of sort. The way he flagged the new teaching was to say, you've heard it said this. And oftentimes he would quote an old rabbi. He would say, You'd heard it, you've heard it said this. Now, he's not going to call him out. That's a very, that would be very uh, rude. But you've heard it said, Jesus quotes Moses, which is insane. You've heard it said, do not murder, but I tell you. Now, he's not contrasting the two teachings, but he's expounding upon them. You've heard it said, do not murder. But I tell you, your anger is what's causing your life and your worship to be halted. And then he says, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, that anyone who looks lustfully at a woman, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin or stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better to lose your one part of your body than to be thrown uh, out into hell. And if your, right land, if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away, it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife, 
must give her a certificate of divorce. Let's pause. What if you divorce your husband? He just says wife. Divorcing your husband was not an option when Jesus was talking. Women had no legal authority to make any sorts of choices about their marriage. They were considered lesser humans at this time. If you're a woman and you witnessed the crime, good luck. Because your testimony did not count in court. We're not to be trusted. Rabbis would often pray to God and thank God that God had seen fit to make them a man. This was a common prayer. This looking down upon women of the day makes what Jesus is saying here a radical teaching. He's not setting up a standard of legal requirements for a divorce. Jesus is lifting up a whole half of humanity to remind people that they have value too. First off, they are not objects for which you, on which you just can lust. You've heard it said, do not commit adultery, but I'm telling you, like, just looking at them as, and objectifying them will say relationally. Just, just that demeans them. That's not the way that Jesus wants us to interact with the world. I've, I've talked about this before, but uh, there's a book in which, that I'm, I'm not a fan of that talks about how like, you're supposed to bounce your eyes away from women. Like, you know, oh, they're, oh, they're pretty, don't look. You know, oh, they're pretty, don't look. You know, like, bounce, don't look. But then there's another great book, which I do love, that suggests that the problem is not that men look at women. The problem is they don't see them fully. They don't see their full humanity. That they see them as an object. That lust, the problem of lust, is when you look upon a human and they are just an end, uh, they are a means to an end. That's a problem. That's not the way God sees the world, therefore it's not the way Jesus sees the world. Anyone who gives, who, uh, he says it's been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. This was the way it worked. Send her away. Here's a certificate. You've earned it. I don't know, certificates just feel like things you earn. Here's a certificate of, di of divorce. And if, and that was an old teaching, if you divorce your wife, you got to give her a certificate of divorce so it doesn't look like she just ran out. This is what happens when Jesus meets the woman at the well. In John chapter 4. Shows up, sits down at a well. He tells the disciples to go in and get some food. He's going to sit there. This woman comes out and is uh, fishing water out of the well. And he says, hey, can you give me, can you give me a drink of water of that? And she said, uh, that's weird. You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. We wouldn't even talk, much less you give me water. That's another way of saying, you see me? He goes, yeah, I know you. You've been divorced six times, and you're living with the seventh. Now, in our culture, in that, our world, we're like, oh, man, that woman. Woo! She has a reputation. No. She had been kicked out of her house six times. By different men. This woman was a victim. 
And now the man that had taken her in won't even do her the service of marrying her. It was a huge social problem. And so she's not some sinner who's just constantly messing up. She's someone who has been victimized by the, the, by the men in her life. And you could get, you could, there, were some, there were two different th- schools of thought at the time. You could get divorced. There were some people, some rabbis that taught, uh, if she just burnt your grilled cheese, that's not their exact wording, but just something as simple as that, then uh, you, can, you could write them a certificate of divorce. And some would say, no, no, it, it, unless, unless she steps out on you, that's the only reason. But what Jesus is teaching is not about how the structure and the system works. He's asking us to see people fully. You've heard it said, just give them a divorce. But I tell you, men, I tell you. And there's a good chance that Jesus is speaking to only men here. That's not confirmed. But there's a good chance that when they heard he was, might be the Messiah, they showed up with swords. He might, there's some scholars that believe he was speaking to an army of a ragtag crew ready to take. And here he's saying, he comes out of the gate and said, you've heard it said do not murder, but I tell you don't be angry. I like thinking of the Sermon on the Mount like this because Jesus is going against the whole men pick up swords and take their land back motif. You've heard it said about women But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. He he is not laying out the details of how exactly adultery works. He's saying the brokenness of the world resides in our, our just dismissing of women. And you're creating a system that's awful. And there's been times where, I, I, when I was a kid, because of this scripture, I remember people getting divorced and then staying single, just waiting out the other one. And so, if they got married first, then they're the one that committed adultery and I'm free to go. It was such a nonsense little ticky-tack way of seeing the word of God. That when Jesus taught us something, he was teaching us, this is, this is how the world is supposed to be. This is how it's supposed, supposed to function. That's why whenever he gives you the, you heard it said, here he's, he goes, and again. He says, you heard it said, do not murder. He says, you heard it said, do not commit adultery. You've heard it said, write, you can write him a certificate of divorce. And he says, again kind of connecting this second one with those previous ones. You've heard it said to people long ago, do not break your oath. But but fulfill to the Lord the vows you've made. But I tell you, don't swear an oath at all. Either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or for the earth, it's God's footstool, or for Jerusalem, because that's the city of the great king. Anyway, just don't, don't swear on your head. You can't make it white or Black. This is back before modern technology. All you need to say is simply yes and no. Anything beyond that comes from the evil one. This whole section, it feels like just promises and then adultery and then divorce and lust. And there's like these bullet points that Jesus wants to give out but this whole section is calling the people of God to be a people who value their promises who value their word you know we could be a people who who value our bible so much that we're running through dark woods to protect the binding And people might look at that and go, oh, look at those Christians. Look at that. There goes some Christians. We could be a people who, no matter what anyone says, we circle up on a football field and pray to show that we pray. 
Jesus has some interesting words about that later. We could be people who have these outward shows of our Christianity and we wear our bracelets and our t-shirts and our hats and we have, we have our bumper stickers and whatever. We have ways of showing the world we're Christian. But what if we were true to our word? What if when we said... I commit to you, my spouse, we mean it. What if we kept that promise through difficult times? Some of you have been married before. And I'm just kidding. Most of you are and have been. It's tough, marriage. Right? Am I speaking out of line here? It's difficult. It, it can be, it can have some bumpy times. The problem is mostly the humans involved. But sometimes it's not even the humans involved. Sometimes it's just difficult. You think today is going to be a normal day and then your roof caves in. You have to call Andy. You think today is just going to be a normal day and then this, this bill comes due that you didn't know that the hospital calls. Or the, like so on and so forth. Sometimes it's just grief and pain and chaos that can shake a marriage. It's all difficult when you've got to go through it together. But he's saying, what if you kept your promise? What if your eyes and your actions and your... And what if... When you said yes, when you said certain, whenever you made a promise, you kept it. What if then? N.T. Wright says, uh, one of the difficulties of the youngest generation and all generations before that is that when they were young, they learned to make promises with their bodies that their hearts weren't going to keep. I don't have to explain that any further, I hope. But there's this sense of I'm committed to something. And whether it's a spouse or whether it's a vocation or whether it's something I just said I would do and I need to do. None of us are sticking the landing on that all the time. But if anything's going to demonstrate our faith, It's going to be when we say something, we mean it. This also means we aren't speaking out of both sides of our mouth. That when we say one thing to one person, we're going to come over to this person and say, (laughs) guess what I said to them over there. The way of Jesus is simple. It's simple, but it's difficult. I've said this before, but I do find that, the, that the, the more complicated we make Christianity, the easier it is to do. I grew up in a church of Christ, um, and we had a cappella. We sang a cappella. And there, if, if, you're, if you're not familiar with Churches of Christ, um, so there's, we have people who didn't grow up in that. Um, acapella is an important part of that for most of us. Um, and for some of us, it's an important part because it's tradition. And for the rest of us, for, for others, not the rest of us, for others, it's an important part because, like, Scripture told us not to have instruments and we might go to hell if we re- play them. That's a real thing. Don't judge us. Your tradition has weird stuff, too. But that was our weird one. And we'd skip to verses. And we would say Ephesians, Ephesians 5. And then, or, and then we'd go to Colossians 3. And then we would um, ignore some of the Psalms. And so it, it, it took some scr- scriptural maneuvering. We looked like 
the matrix, dodging and finding the scriptures we actually need. But do you know, as complicated as that was, to figure it out and do the right thing and make sure we're not doing... Do you know how easy it is on a scale of 1 to 10 to not have a piano? No one accidentally apprehends a piano. It's so easy to not have instruments. You just don't. Most of us wake up fully divested of all pianos. That's how we wake up. We don't have a piano. You have, it takes a lot of work to get one. Super complex teaching. Super simple to follow. This super simple teaching. Keep your word. I think you're going to be wrestling with that for the rest of your life. Keep your promises. Honor the people around you. By meaning what you say and saying what you mean and holding up your end of it. Super simple teaching. And I don't think there's a one of us who think we've perfected it. So this call of Jesus to these people about the way you interact with women, the way you, the way you uh, honor your marriage... The way, the, 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 what does it mean when you say yes? And what does it mean when you say no? We're not perfect, as Trent said. Also, Trent, I was good looking in high school too, so. Just kidding, no I wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't close. Um, our wedding picture looks like a 12-year-old boy won a radio contest to marry a model. It, <laughs> it looks so ridiculous. She's wearing this, we're walking out, and she's just like glowing naturally. And I'm like, I got a woman, you know, like I'm, <laughs> I'm so ridiculous. But <laughs> I'll show it one day. It's, it's, it, I, and you'll say, he was right. That, that's exactly what it looks like. No, but we all struggle. We all, like, we're not perfect. We're not calling to perfection. But we are trying to refocus our way, our, our, our mindset away from this idea that Christianity is about just getting the things right in public. But what it's actually about, we're refocusing it onto what is your, what is your, what is your character in tough moments? Now, there may be some guilt, and there may be some shame where you're looking back and, and you say, oh, I was, oh, yeah, I, I messed that up. You've said three things today, Benjamin, that I was not good at. Well, as much as we would love to pray about changing your past, we can't. But I would like to introduce you to Jesus. Jesus. The way of Jesus doesn't just come with us telling you there's a new way to look at life and how you're supposed to abandon the old way of life. The way of Jesus comes with a salvation and forgiveness for that old way anyway. When it creeps up on you, I can't do anything about it. I can't go back and change that. But Jesus did. And so that's why I follow Jesus. Not just because he saved me, but he centered me. In my best moments, I can see the world through the way in which Jesus sees the world. In my worst moments, I abandon that and try to see it my way. Try to fix things my way. But in this teaching, it's super simple. Your promise matters. Your word matters. You keeping, honoring what you say 
matters. How you view the world, the people in it, are they worth your yes being yes, your no being no? Are they worth your full sight where you see them as fully human? Jesus says yes. You know, I, if you are somebody who's wrestling with a relationship, wrestling with just, maybe, maybe you just have this deep general anger for people around you. We think that you need to pray with people. We think you need to pray with us, whether you can come and pray with me or we're going to have a prayer team. Uh, we have people in the back ready and willing to pray with you. But it is our hope that you take, you let this community be the community that leads you to Jesus, both in the way you see the world and in the way Jesus sees you. Free from your shame free from your old way of living and free to follow this new way that deeply honors and values the people around you and the promises you make therein.